it's time for the next moderator to take over. I request the participants to stay online. The next moderator will join you shortly. Good afternoon, everyone. The next talk is on unraveling the epigenetic mechanisms. We have with this Dr. Arun Kumar Dayanand. He is Associate Professor of Biotechnology, Pondicherry University. This session will be chaired by Dr. S. Ravi Kumar, who is Associate Professor and Assistant Director of Research, Multidisciplinary Center for Biomedical Research at Arupadi Vedu Medical College. Dr. Ravi Kumar completed his PhD in Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at Pondicherry University, India. He has worked for more than nine years in South Korea as a postdoctoral fellow, as a research professor, assistant professor. His research interests lie in the area of diagnostics, pharmacogenetics, genetic engineering, evidence-based medicine, bioinformatics, nanotechnology. He has also published more than 50 research articles and has received a patent. He's presented many lectures and oral presentations as keynote speaker at various scientific meetings. Sir, we invite you to chair the session. Thank you, Dr. Arti. So today we have a, a eminent scientist, uh, Dr. Arun Kumar Dayalan. I'm very happy to introduce him. Uh, he's an associate professor in the Department of Bio Biotechnology, Pondicherry University. Dr. Arun Kumar Dayalan did his PhD in biochemistry at the Jax University, Germany. After finishing his PhD with a special distinction, he has also completed his postdoctoral work at the same university. And uh, Dr. Arun Kumar Dayalan uh, has been received the Innovative Young Scientist Young Biotechnologist Award from DPT, the Government of India. And also he received the U UGC Research Award from the Government of India. And he was being awarded nine times a consecutive years uh, as a best teacher award at Pondicherry University. Currently, he's heading a research project with a budget of, of 3.6 crores sanctioned to him by uh, DPT Welcome Trust uh, Indian Alliance. So only the few scientists and uh, few professors have received this uh, 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 fellowship, actually. It's a, it's a great honor to him, actually. He has completed uh, and uh, Dr. Dialin has completed several projects with a total budget of 2.39 course from uh, different funding agencies. And uh, he also published 39 articles in the reputed journals with a cumulative impact factor of uh, 227 with H index of uh, 19, I, I, I10 index of 26. And uh, he's also an associate editor in the, in the research journal PMC Biochemistry and also edited a uh, a structural activity of functional of protein methyl transferase in the life impact factor 3.8. Now I call upon uh, uh, Dr. Arun Kumar Dayalan for its topic in epigenetic mechanism. So, for, for, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, all of you. Am I audible to the? Yes, Arun, you are audible. Right. All right. So it's uh, in fact it's uh, time is exactly at one o'clock. Uh, I don't know whether it's the right time to talk about science for a long time. Maybe I'll uh, reduce my talk for uh, thirty-five to forty minutes. Try to finish within that. And uh, before going to the talk, I would like to thank Dr. Ravi for inviting me uh, to deliver a lecture in this uh, wonderful e-conference. I also thank the organizers and. Uh, the AVMC Institute for hosting such a wonderful conferences. And it is a, indeed a pleasure uh, to deliver a lecture in this conference. So this talk, what I have designed to this talk is a little bit different than my usual ways. So we usually we tend to present a lot of research data and uh, new advances from the lab. But this time I have decided since uh, Dr. Ravi told me that a lot of clinicians are attending the conferences. So I was thinking uh, maybe I should not do that and I will do it in other ways so that we will appreciate some of the epigenetic signaling mechanisms which is going in the human systems, okay? So that's what I'm going to do this. Let me share the screen.
is my presentation is visible the screen is visible to you yes sir yes sir okay all right so we know that all the human cells carry the same genetic information but yet they differentiate into different cell types and tissues so the genetic information in the human cell should be expressed at right time and right place so the regulation of this gene expression in different tissues are brought about by various epigenetic mechanisms okay so the term epigenetics itself can be defined as a change in phenotype that is heritable but that does not involve the change in the dna sequences on the one hand this epigenetic signals are stable and heritable on the other hand they are reversible that's the beauty of this epigenetic signaling system is concerned whereas if you have a genetic mutation you had it for your life you cannot change it but epigenetic signals can be written erased and rewritten depends on the environmental cues whatever the cell is facing so in the higher eukaryotes even in lower eukaryotes for that matter the chromatin the fundamental structure of the chromatin exists in two distinct structural and functional conformation one we call it as a euchromatin which is a transcriptionally active and silent state of the chromatin the other one is highly condensed state of a chromatin which is transcriptionally silent so the switch between these two different structural and functional states of the chromatin is mediated by various epigenetic mechanisms and the major ones are listed here the major ones which includes the post translation modifications which are taking place in the n terminal tails of the core histones and the addition of his uh, linker histones and the dna methylation atp dependent chromatin remodeling complexes they can switch any of the structure from heterochromatin to euchromatin or euchromatin back to heterochromatin okay so they are controlling the chromatin structure and the chromatin structures uh, structure in fact decides what all the genes needs to be expressed in particular Uh, point in time and space and this uh, from book we know that standard information the contour length of uh, the dna of a human cell is 2 meter but this 2 meter dna needs to be packed in a size of a nucleus which is less than 10 micron in the size right so this means this uh, dna is extremely compacted up to 10 to the power 6 fold in an organized way inside the nucleus so the dna the the dna it forms a chromatin structure the fundamental unit of a chromatin is a nucleosome which is made up of a histone octamer which is wrapped with the dna and the histone octamer consists of two copies of four different types of histones h2a h2b h3 and h4 and this histone octamer is wrapped with your dna and that forms the basic unit of the chromatin this is uh, your typical beads on a string structure or a 11 nanometer fiber or which we classical terms we call it as euchromatin and again this 11 nanometer fiber tends to fold to form a higher order structure which is a 30 nanometer fiber and 30 nanometer fiber is your typical heterochromatin structure and all the dna dependent process whether you talk about the dna replication or a transcription or repair everything happens at this level if it if it if it folds into 30 nanometer fiber the dna dependent process are not possible okay then the 30 nanometer fiber further coils to form a loops loops form a rosettes and with the help of staphylococcal protein form, finally form a full Uh, chromosome regular structures right and if you look at this basic unit this nucleosome as it showed you this histone octamer which is wrapped with the, which is wrapped with the dna if the diameter of the structure is 11 nanometer that's how we come up with the hypothesis 11 nanometer the typical euchromatin structure and what is most interesting is this is a single nucleosome and this the, 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 the inside you see this histone proteins there are four different types of histone proteins are available inside this nucleosome and each one is present in two copies and this is the dna which is wrapping around the histone octamer what i would like to point out is the interesting phenomena is the n terminal tails of this histone proteins are protruding out from the nucleosome structures okay so they are part of the nucleus the histone proteins is a part of a nucleosome but if you see the tails which are coming out from the nucleosome structures and these tails are totally unstructured completely unstructured they are just like a peptides which are hanging out from the nucleosome structures and this peptides undergo a lot of modifications that modification decides whether the chromatin should stay in a heterochromatin structure or euchromatin structure and again the assembly of the histone octamer is not a random process so first you have this h3 and h4 histone should form a dimer and two of this h3 and h4 dimer should interact to form a h3 h4 tetramer 
And similarly, H2A and H2B forms a dimer, and two of the dimers forms the tetramer. And these two tetramers then again interact and forms the histone octamer, which is wrapped of the DNA to form a new, typical nucleosome structure. And all these processes are not random events. These are, these are guided process. There are a lot of chromatin assembly factors, the protein factors which are involved in this process to make a proper nucleosome structure. And as I told you, the, is the central portion of your nucleosome structure is occupied by the histone proteins. The interesting aspect is the tails, the tails, the, the, the end terminal region, the first 30 to 40 amino acids in the histone tails, the, the histone protein as such is unstructured. They do not form a secondary structures, but these unstructured tails, which comes out of the nucleosome structure and they're protruding out from the nucleosome structure, meaning that these tails are accessible for various enzymes to do a lot of modifications. If an uh, enzyme has to access an uh, amino acid, which is present at the core of the protein, which is difficult, but if it is uh, presented in the form of tail, which is protruding out from the common structure, then it is easily manipulatable. All right, so as I told you, the tails undergo a lot of post-translation modifications, unstructured post-translation modifications, such as you have acetylation, methylation, ubiquitination, ADP ribosylation, name a post-translation modification, you'll find it on the histone tails, phosphorylation, everything, all kinds of modifications are available. And each modification have an influence on the chromatin structure. There are certain modifications which promotes the euchromatin structure. There are certain modifications which promotes the heterochromatin structure. For example, if you have an acetylation modification in the histone tiles, that definitely forms your euchromatin structure, 11 nanometer fiber. So then the transcription is possible, gene expression is possible. But if you have some other modification like a methylation at K9, so this, this, these are the different uh, lysines and you know uh, other amino acids which have got modified by different enzymes. For example, if you have a H3 tile, if the K9 is methylated, then it forms a heterochromatin structure. Whereas if K4 is methylated, it forms a euchromatin structure. For acetylation, we have a clear cut signal. All acetylation promotes the euchromatin structures and the absence of acetylation promotes the heterochromatin structures. But if you talk about the methylation, uh, the, uh, the functional outcome is totally different. Depending upon the position of the lysine or arginine, which is getting methylated, the functional outcome may vary. For example, as I told you, uh, if the methylation happens at K4, it promotes the euchromatin structure. If it happens at K9 or K27 of H3, that promotes the heterochromatin structure, which is uh, going to suppress the gene expression. And we have to also understand that each lysine can be methylated at three different degrees. Either they can undergo for a monomethylation or a dimethylation or trimethylation. Similarly, arginines can also be methylated they can undergo a monomethylation or a dimethylation. And arginine dimethylation comes in two flavor, whether they can undergo for asymmetric dimethylation or symmetric dimethylation. These are the small post transition modifications which are present in the histone tiles. And these combinations of this different modification decides whether the chromatin should stay in the heterochromatin state or a euchromatin state. Suppose if you want to express a gene, then the chromatin should, heterochromatin should melt into euchromatin structure, then only the Access, the, the DNA is accessible for your transcriptional machinery like RNA pal. Right, again, I showed on the previous slide, different modification brings about a lot of different outcomes on the chromatin structure. For example, I told you the K9, if it is methylated, it forms a heterochromatin. If K4 is methylated, it forms a euchromatin structure. How the small methyl group addition brings about the large structural changes in the chromatin? This is done by a set of proteins known as the reader proteins or effector proteins. These are the proteins which could recognize this modification and translate this modification into function. For example, if K9 is methylated, this is recognized by a special reader protein called heterochromatin protein 1, which is so the heterochromatin protein 1, if it binds, then it tends to multimerize among itself, thereby bringing different nucleosomes close to each other and forms a strong heterochromatin structure. Similarly, if you see this H3K4 methylation mark, this small methylation mark, how can open up the chromatin structure? This is because the methylation mark is again recognized by a special protein known as a BPTF. Once the BPTF binds to this methylation mark, and this protein do not bind to the histone tails if this residues are unmethylated. Only if it is methylated, it can bind. So if a H3K4 trimethylation, if we have, that invites the binding of your BPTF protein factor. And BPTF protein factor is going to bring it, going to bring the chromatin remodeling complexes because BPTF can interact with the chromatin remodeling complex and the chromatin remodeling complexes utilizes ATP and tries to melt the hard heterochromatin structure back to euchromatin structures wherein the transcription is again possible, right? 
And uh, just to illustrate that different tails are there, you have H2A, H2B, H3, and H4, each presents, each of them present in two copies. And all these tails undergo different various types of modifications. And major modifications are happening in the H3 and H4 tiles. So this is just to illustrate, uh, I, I don't want you to understand what is going on here, just to give a overview of the pictures, what types of post transcript modifications are possible with this histone proteins. And as you can notice this, a lot of modifications are possible. Okay, so for example, arginine 2 can be methylated, K4 can be methylated, again, R8 can be methylated, K9 can be acetylated or methylated, S10 can be phosphorylated, K14 can be acetylated, different modifications are possible, just to put it on a nutshell, okay. And the combinations of this different modification decides the chromatin structures. So this is in case of H3, and this is in case of H4, again, a lot of modification, and H2A, H2B, relatively small modifications, and H2A and H2B also undergoes ubiquitination. And this ubiquitination is a mono-ubiquitination. Ubiquitination, don't be confused with the polyubiquitination, which is a mark for proteasomal degradation. This ubiquitination is a PTM, which provides a certain signal for the chromatin structure. So to summarize, uh, most of the modification, promotes the formation of heterochromatin, for example, especially the methylation. If a methylation happens in the K9, K27 of H3, or K20 of H4, or K36 of H3, that promotes the heterochromatin structure. Again, sumylation promotes the heterochromatin structure. Okay, whereas the methylation, if it happens at K4, different lysine residue in the same histone protein, that promotes the euchromatin structures. Acetylation, all acetylation in general promotes the euchromatin structure. Okay, so deacetylation represents your heterochromatin structures and phosphorylation also promotes your euchromatin structure and ubiquitination is so special. If it happens at H2A protein, it promotes the heterochromatin structure, whereas if it happens at H2B, then it promotes the euchromatin structure. So, so these are the different modifications. All the modifications are possible in the histone tiles. At any given point in time, what are the modifications which are present in the histone tile? That we call it as a histone code. It's a kind of a sign language, code language. This PTMs forms a code, and this code decides what are the modifications are there, what modifications are there, whether these modifications promote the euchromatin structure or hetero heterochromatin structures. Based on that, the chromatin goes to the 30 nanometer configuration or 11 nanometer configuration. Based on that, the gene expression is possible. Okay, so if, if it stays in the heterochromatin, there is no expression as possible from the, those regions of the chromatin as concerned. Right, so to move from, again, from euchromatin to heterochromatin, you also need a linker histones. This is called H1. This is not part of your nucleosome structure, but the two nucleosomes are connected with the DNA called a linker DNA, and the linker DNA should be associated with the H1 to form a 30 nanometer fiber. So the linker DNA, uh, means the linker histone sounds like a glue because if you have a two nucleosomes which is supposed to stack with one another, there is an electrostatic repulsion comes from the phosphate backbone of your DNA. So you need some positively charged protein which is present between to allow the stacking of the two nucleosomes to interact with each other. And this is safely done by the linker histone. So linker histone is essential to go for the heterochromatin structure. So this is just to give a overview. So the from 11 nanometer fiber, that is euchromatin to 30 nanometer fiber, that is heterochromatin is possible. And this is guided by the protein factors as well as the PTMs which are present in the histone tail as well as the DNA methylation. DNA methylation promotes the structure, heterochromatin structure. So absence of DNA methylation promotes your euchromatin structures, okay? So generally a melting of heterochromatin to the euchromatin is done by ATP dependent chromatin remodeling complexes and the mobilization from lava nanometer to this is done by our H3K9 trimethylation modification which is recognized by HP1 proteins and so on and so forth. And H1 is of course, it is needed to move this direction. And and the PCC represents the polycomb group of proteins and polycomb group of proteins is going to introduce this H3K27 trimethylation modification that is very, very essential to move the chromatin from euchromatin state to heterochromatin state. All right. So I, I just give some, some, of, some of the impact of uh, different modifications. First, we'll start with the acetylation. So as I told you, in general, the modifications, histone acetylation modification, promotes the open 
chromatin structure, that's the euchromatin structures, wherein the transcription is possible. If you don't have acetylation modifications in the chromatin, the histone tails, that, that helps in the condensation of the chromatin that is going to block the gene expression is concerned. So then once you know this aspect, then many transcription factors, many transcriptional activators are found to be associated with histone acetyl transferases, the enzymes which introduces the acetylation modification. So in order to do the transcription, not only you have to assemble the pre-initiation complex at the promoter, but you also has to open up the chromatin, making the DNA template available for the RNA polymerase to do the transcription. Okay, so for melting of the DNA, often many transcriptional transactivators recruits histone acetyl transferases. Okay, and opposite is true for your transcriptional repressors because the repressor binds to the repressor elements and often recruits histone deacetylases, which is going to remove the acetylation modification, puts the chromatin in a condensed state and thereby inhibiting the gene expression. So I think histone acetylation, methylation, the presence of this modification is discovered in 64. And I think it took about almost 30 years to identify the first histone acetyl transferase. This is done by David Ellis group. In the next year, histone deacetylase has been identified again by Schreiber group. Then followed by, so, so, so then once, once they identify the enzymes, there are many groups which are working on the transcription factor complexes. They identified all the activators, most of the activators that lose this histone acetyl transferases and uh, most of your uh, repressors tend to recruit the histone deacetylases as a part and parcel of your transcription process you need these enzymes to open up the chromatin and the part and parcel of your regulatory suppression process you have to close the chromatin with the help of heterochromatin with the help of histone deacetylases and uh, one group of histone deacetylases one class is called so we have different classes of histone deacetylases as i told you histone deacetylases are going to remove the acetyl group and acetylation modification in the histone tail thereby promoting heterochromatin one class of histone deacetylases are called serotins okay so this information comes from yeast then it is it was found in the humans also we have seven different types of serotins and the serotin proteins are so special and this serotonin is a histone deacetylase. This removes the acetylation modification from the histone tail by using a very complicated reaction mechanism, which utilizes NAD plus as a cofactor to remove the simple acetylation mark. Because usually the acetyl group can be the enzyme can enzyme can simply do the hydrolysis to remove the you can you can do the acid base hydrolysis to remove the acid, uh, acetylation modification. But some of this enzyme does very complicated way of a reaction mechanism to utilizing NAD plus to remove this uh, acetyl mark. Because okay, so initially people do not have any clue about it. Later they found that these enzymes are present for the purpose. Okay. For example, uh, during a calorie restriction or when you're in a fasting state, what happens is your NAD plus level goes up and NADH level goes down. Okay. If NAD plus level goes up means then NAD plus level, the higher NAD plus level activates the serotines and the serotines, if you have a sufficient NAD plus as a cofactor, that is going to deacetylate many regions of the chromatin and many regions of the chromatins are put under the heterochromatin state, especially the RDNA region, which is supposed to code for the RRNA genes. So if you silence this RRNA expression, what is going to happen is you silence the translation, the global protein synthesis you put down. If you go down with the global protein synthesis, then your metabolism decreases. If your metabolism if your metabolism goes down, then you have a lesser and lesser reactive oxygen species, lesser and lesser damage to your DNA. As a result, you delay the aging process. So calorie restriction is uh, many, many studies connected with uh, delaying in aging, but the molecular connections are understood with the help of serotins because in yeast and other model organisms, they have shown that if you knock out the serotines and the, uh, the even if you do the calorie restriction between the control knockout and this knockout of serotonin, you don't see the effect. So partly the effects with the calorie restriction longevity is kind of mediated through the serotonin pathway because serotonin during your calorie restriction or fasting, you increase the NAD plus level, which is going to activate the serotonin and serotonin are going to remove the scale mark. Okay, so that's the idea. That's what they shown. And again, as I told you that the synthry and Nord Corest and NCOR are different well studied repressor complexes, once the histone deacetylase has been identified, a lot of these complexes are tend to have the histone deacetylases as a part of their complexes, meaning that they are not only blocking the transcription, but also they are condensing the chromatin, making them to heterochromatin, making them the, ma ma making the transcription is not possible. Right, and uh, 
this picture just to tend to say this is a collection of genes almost 100 genes these are the genes which are expressed in low quantity and these are the genes which are highly transcribed means are highly expressed and what they have found is this is a transcription start site and this is your uh, a proximal site to the transcription and this is a distal site and you have a protein coding region is shown here there is a five prime end you have a three prime end and this is a mid end okay and throughout the genes this uh, 100 highly transcribed genes and the 100 low transcribed genes and they profile the histone acetylation modification and what they have found is all the highly transcribed genes are enriched with the different histone acetylation modification whereas the genes which are transcribed at low quantities lack histone acetylation in many different regions so this is again put it in a global context that the presence of histone acetylation modification promotes the open chromatin structure which in turn facilitate the expression of the genes all right so again if you come to dna methylation and dna methylation is also one of the major modification which promotes the heterochromatin structure and the dna methylation happens in mammals only in the cg dinucleotide context okay so uh, in plants the cg can be methylated and again cng can be methylated and cnn can be methylated but in mammals this happens exclusively with the cg dinucleotide context and the c is methylated at its five prime positions and uh, you have a methylated DNA in the adult uh, differentiated tissue. So each time when a replication happens, I means so during before the cell division, the replication proceeds in your S phase, right? And during this cell replicate, during the DNA replication, what happens is the methylated cells. So, so you, here there are four CG sites are shown here: one, two, three, and four. Among these four CG sites, three CG sites are methylated, and there is one unmethylated CG site. Right. So during replication, you should copy the methylation pattern to the DNA. Right. So during methylation, after replication, the DNA becomes a state called called as a hemimethylated state, wherein because the DNA undergoes a semi-conservative replication, one of the strands is world strand, which carries a methylation pattern, and the newly synthesized strand lacks this methylation pattern. Right. And this methylation newly synthesized strand. The methylation pattern is reintroduced by a special enzyme known as a maintenance methyl transferase, which we also call it as a DNMT1. The DNMT1 enzyme works like a photocopier machine. So whatever the methylation pattern which is present in the old strand is copied to the new strand. For example, if this CG is methylated, again, that will be methylated. If it is unmethylated, that will not be methylated by DNMT1. So DNMT1 is a maintenance methyl transferase, which copies the methylation pattern from the old strand to new strand after each round of replication. Okay, so that's how you preserve the methylation pattern. And this methylation pattern is very important for the tissue identity. So if you take a hepatocyte or a biocyte, they, they are hepatocyte because of their transcriptome, because of their proteome. And their transcriptome is shaped by the chromatin organization, whatever percent. And the chromatin organization is shaped by the PTMs and the histone tails and the DNA methylation patterns. So DNA methylation pattern is very, very essential to maintain the tissue specificity, right? So that is taken care. That's why you get a hep hep when, when a hepatocyte divides, you get a hepatocyte because the methylation pattern is preserved by the maintenance methyl transferase enzyme. Right. So you uh, so so the, the, this is a typical situation in the adult cell. So you have a DNA which is fully methylated. Then after a round of replication, it goes for hemimethylated states. Then the, you have a maintenance methyl transfer DNMT1, which brings back the hemimethylated state to the fully methylated state. But what happens during gametogenesis is when you form the gamete, which type of methylation pattern will you put it in the gamete? Whether we will put the methylation pattern which is present in the myocyte or neuronal cells, we cannot do this, right? So in general, what happens during gametogenesis, there is a global erasure of the methylation pattern. You completely remove all the methylation pattern during gametogenesis then the gametes do not have a methylation pattern and when you form a zygote then when you form an embryo during embryogenesis then the methylation pattern is recreated with the help of a de novo methyl transferase dnmt3 3a and dnmt3b so this enzymes so dnmt1 maintains the methylation patterns in the differentiated tissue and dnmt3a and dnmt3b which are de novo dna methyl transferases which are going to introduce the methylation pattern during embryogenesis which helps in the differentiation of the different tissues and uh, in context of the gene expression regulation is there if you have a if you have a methylation if you have if you have a methylation the black dots represents the methylation and you, uh, the circles with the hole without black dot which represents the unmethylated cg so majority of the human genes are preceded by a cpg island in their promoters and if the cpg islands are methylated 
then it forms a heterochromatin structure in this promoter region and there is no transcription is possible so the presence of methylation at the promoter region especially in the cp cpg islands blocks the transcription of the downstream gene and if there is no methylation transcription is possible okay so the presence of methylation blocks the transcription but the absence of methylation do not say anything about it because the absence of methylation does not guarantee for the transcription because you need the uh, you need the transcription factors and uh, rna polymerase to pre initiation complex mediator complexes many things are required for the proper transcription to happen only thing is the absence of methylation says that there is no inhibition from the dna methylation point of view i think i'm running short of time okay so maybe we will skip many of these things because i don't have a time only four but it's all left this is not so good right so then be, before ending my talk i would like to so, so this is this is a slide again showing that the, i told you about the h3k9 trimethylation marks the heterochromatin right so this is the experiment which proves that this trimethylation modification what they have done is they fix the cells and look for the different modifications using a monoclonal antibodies which are specific for different modifications and uh, this is the dapi staining dapi staining is shown in a green dapi you know it stains your nucleus if you add tons but if you add a limited quantity of dapi which stains only the heterochromatins with in the nucleus okay so it does not bind to all the dna if you add ample amount of dapi you will, it will bind the entire nucleus in, including rna okay but if 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 a limited quantity of dapi has been added that forms that that stains only the heterochromatin spots and these are the heterochromatin spots and if you see there is a co localization between the heterochromatin spots and the modification what we found is the h3k9 trimethylation modification is perfectly co co localizes with the dapi dense heterochromatin spots suggesting that this is the mark which mediates the heterochromatin formation and we also have a lot of other data to prove that how the k9 trimethylation modification converts the heterochromatin to heterochromatin i think i cannot uh, have the time to go through that maybe before ending the talk i will tell you a small story then we will end the talk and this you know right this is a honey bee social insect so there are three types of honey bees so drones you know queens and worker bees and for today's discussion we will leave about the drones we will focus only on the queens and worker bees okay queen bee lives up to 4 years whereas worker bee lives only 45 days and queen bees are fertile worker bees are sterile okay so there is a huge difference 45 days is the life span of a worker bee 4 years is the life life span of queen bee and uh, queen bee being fertile and the worker bee is sterile and worker bee on top of this has to do all the uh, donkey works which is supposed to maintain the hive bring the uh, bring the uh, nectar and so on and so forth a lot of different works are assigned to worker bee and they live only 45 days but if you compare if you compare the genome of worker bee and queen bee there is no difference absolutely no difference the genome of worker bee and queen bee is exactly same in fact when a larvae hatches out from the egg it is not decided whether it should become a queen bee or a worker bee so the larvae which comes from the egg starts feeding a special type of food known as royal jelly okay in fact all the larvae feeds this royal jelly some of the larvae feeds this royal jelly very extensively and those larvae which feeds this royal jelly very extensively will become a queen queen bee okay and those larvae which eats less of royal jelly will become a worker bee a small diet a simple diet which changes the bee as a worker bee or a queen bee 45 days or a four years life span this is a dramatic difference okay and what people found is then what what is there is no difference in the genome how does this worker bee as a worker bee and queen bee as a queen bee and the difference lies in the epigenome what they found is the presence of dna methylation in the worker bee which is largely absent from the queen bee okay so there is a dna methylation pattern which happens in this larvae that happens in a different manner between your worker bee and queen bee there is an enzyme called dnmt3 the one which we have seen dnova dna methyl transfer which is also we have a homolog in the human systems okay so this dnmt3 enzyme the dnmt3 enzyme which is responsible for putting a methylation pattern in the worker bee is inhibited in the queen bee so the queen bee if you take the genome and profile the methylation pattern and worker bee if you take the genome and profile the methylation pattern worker bee has a lot of methylation pattern whereas queen bee has a very less methylation pattern the enzyme is present dnmt3 is present here as well as here but only thing is the dnmt3 is inhibited by the extensive intake of royal jelly 
perhaps relatively by how some inhibitor which inhibits your dnmt3 enzyme which blocks the methylation pattern as a result that it becomes a queen and this is the experiment this is a science paper you can understand that this is in a control situation a regular situation majority of the larvae develops into worker only very few larvae which develop into queen but if you inhibit dnmt3 so the, this is a rna rnai so if you add a sarna means it's a, a small chemical rna which can knock down this dnmt3 enzyme then if you see majority of the larvae which develops into queens only very few larvae develop into workers so this suggests that a small difference in diet which makes a change in the epigenome pattern not in a single base change in the genome which brings about totally different phenotype from worker bee to queen bee this happens through dna methylation totally epigenetic phenomena okay so i think i will end my talk here because the time of symbol is coming up on all right if i have any questions i'm happy to answer uh, uh, thanks uh, dr arun as usual you have explained in a, in a very detailed mode i hope our research scholars and the faculty members will benefit from your talk uh, the simple the simple chemical reaction like acetylation and methylation as as i mean as doing a great job we know the uh, basics but you have explained in a very detailed manner so that each and every faculty member is able to understand in uh, in a clear way so my question to you is that uh, uh, the, the what are the major challenges in epigenetic studies uh uh to the development of uh, biomarkers uh development of biomarkers for uh, different diseases yeah different diseases ah okay so this is uh, see it's the basically problem, problem. i have a biosensor uh, lab mm -hmm. so i just asking whether this kind of uh, studies can be uh, for uh, any kind of disease biomarker we can able to develop those things a lot of lot of biomarkers have been identified the aberrant epigenetic signaling has been identified in a lot of diseases starting from cancers diabetes name a disease you will find some aberrant epigenetic signal because majority of the cancers nowadays you don't find a mutations only the epigenetic silencing many people do not have a p53 or keras mutation but their expressions are either elevated or down regulated just by epigenetic mechanisms and now we have a lot of enzymes we we identify several enzymes which does this modification in a different context and if you inhibit this epigenetic enzymes not to do this modification okay then you don't silence the tumor suppressor gene or you don't over express the oncogenes for example okay so this is like a balance so this balance is created by this modification and this modifications are introduced by this enzymes uh, but problem is uh, but problem is if some of this enzymes are misregulated okay so then you do the over modification then you suppress the expression of tumor suppressor gene or you do the less modification or wrong modification then you bring about the expression of oncogenes okay so then yeah then then the disease results in or disorder results in for for example for instance so these enzymes can be a potential target so there is a drug therapy called epigenetic drug therapy a lot of drugs are in clinical trials already which targeting different dna methyl transferases histone deslases and uh, histone lysine methyl transferases prmts protein arginine methyl transferases different epigenetic enzymes are hot target for the different uh, you know this is therapies right so th this is there you can use this enzymes as a biomarker but problem is many times this enzymes and marks are elevated for many different reasons not only for the gene expression so maybe we may not discriminate this modification the aberrant modification is the cause or the consequence sometimes that con confusion will come so what will be the practical difficulties will be faced by a researcher when uh, during this process practical difficulty is sometimes uh, see if if you want to do the chromatin modification profiling you need a uh, quite a bit of tissues to do this okay so many see uh, genetic studies you can do with pbmc blood cells because the genome is same everywhere right but epigenome differs from tissues to tissues right so to collect the sample tissue sample from a patient is, uh, you you get it from cancerous patients but for many other diseases it's difficult right so that's the problem because if if, a gen, if you want to study the association of a polymorphism for example genetic mutations with uh, any disease it is easy because genome is same everywhere you can collect the blood samples it's like you know 
uh, very easy to get the samples and you do the DNA sequencing or you, you do the profiling of the particular SNPs and you can correlate with the disease. It's very simple. But here, epigenome is epigenome differs from tissues to tissues. I cannot take a blood samples to study a disease in a myocyte. That's not possible. That's a problem. Okay. And you said limitation, that the, not a problem, limitation perhaps. Okay. And you have said that the factors affecting the epigenetics, no, like the royal jelly you have been talking about, which gives you the, I mean, the diet will play an important role in methylation and uh, the process. Yes. So there, are several, yes. there are several environmental factors affecting, uh, I mean, day-to-day, uh, -day, uh, which, which is not present in an uh, earlier situation. Yes. Uh, so this uh, contract the evolution, no, the epigenetics, does epigenetics contract the evolution? No, it is on par with it, in line with evolution. In line you have to adapt it in line with evolution, of course. Because now one nature neuroscience paper in which what they found is the pups, the, the pups which are delivered from the you know mice, which were some of the pups were allowed to stay with mother, some of the pups were separated from the mother. Okay, but mm. otherwise they are providing nutrition, everything is same. Exactly same. Only the pups which stays with the mother gets all the hugging, you know, grooming and licking, all this, you know, warmth and all the things from the mother. That that's the only portion which is missing in the pups. And if you see that behavioral pattern, that's completely different. And the pups which stays with mother is very very responsive to the stress, and they are very uh, resistant to the stress. And what they found is there is a lot of DNA methylation pattern changing in their glucocorticoid receptor promoter between these two mass. Okay, two pups. So this means something like a touch and a hug. All these things can change something fundamentally in the chromatin modifications, which can have a phenotype. That's very interesting. Okay. And uh, in, in morning when I was been browsing, I found that it is a ghost in our gene. Uh, what is your comment on it? Uh, or... The gene. Yeah, ghost. No idea. I'm sorry. No, I don't know in what context they are. No, no. Uh, when I was just browsing the epigenetics, I found that this uh, line, the epigenetics is a ghost in our gene. Not a ghost. It is a adaptability, adaptability of features. Okay. So it is adaptability. It is adaptability. I would consider this as adaptable, adaptable signals. Okay. So uh, because the, uh, for a different situations, you need a different uh, proteins and different transcriptome. And this is possible by, uh, you know, the plasticity of the epigenetic signaling. Okay. So you, you can introduce modification to silence something. Okay. So if the situation changes, you can bring back the same expression back. Okay. And this is the plasticity. Yeah. And you have been related the aging with epigenetics. Whether this royal jelly can be given for our... Uh, uh... Yeah, no, no clinical trials, no studies on that. And people were trying to find even uh, factors which inhibits the DNA 3 I think there's still now no paper I found. Okay. No, no support, no literature no, support, no, no, no scientific support, support uh, no scientific support so far. But the calorie restriction, that uh, that process is known, very well studied, well documented. But these royal jellies have been, uh, I mean, sold. Uh, for, I mean, uh, in China as well as in Korea. Uh, uh, okay. No idea. Not properly supported by scientific literature. Okay, I think there is a one question from uh, Dr. I. Ganesh. Yes. Uh, it was an informative talk. Thanks for it. Here, I would like to know the role and usage of highly condensed etrochromatin as it, it is not expressed like a euchromatin. The uh, role of etrochromatin is just puts the chromatin in a stable because your genome is filled with a lot of. Uh, Transposons, retro transposons. Okay, so if if it is uh, if the genome if the genome is not packed in the form of heterochromatin, what happens is, is transposons are starts moving. Okay, so the transposons in case if it hits an essential gene, then it is going to lead to a lethality. Okay, so heterochromatin is a way to put the chromatin in a silent state. Only it is converted to euchromatin if and when it is needed. Okay, so otherwise. It should stay as a heterochromatic. Okay, so this is a situation. Even I told you the during gametogenesis, you have a global erasure of a DNA methylation pattern, right? That time the transposons are starts moving. So the organism developed a specialized pathway called a pi RNA mediated pathway. Have you heard about pi RNA, PI RNA? It's a special RNA which is which is expressed exclusively in germ cells, and they are supposed to silence the transposon. Because the transposons starts moving in during gametogenesis, because there is no DNA methylation, there is no heterochromatin section. That's the problem. 
right? So the organism evolved for a different pathway to silence this. Uh, this provides the genomic stability. And some, uh, if, if you put all the genome in a euchromatin states, most of the genes are expressing all the time, which you don't want. You want to regulate the expression because there are genes which need to be silent and should be expressed whenever it is needed. How do you do this? You have this chromatin arrangement. I think uh, Dr. Arun has answered for Dr. Ganesh. Uh, is there any questions? I think people yes, are waiting for lunch. Uh, yeah, I think. Uh, if any of the participants have questions, they can uh, post them in the question box. And uh, Dr. Arun Kumar would be very happy to uh, answer your queries. So, yes, like of to... course. So thank you very much, sir. We would uh, like to honor you with a certificate and a memento. Thank you. We would also like to honor our chairperson for the day, Dr. Isravi Kumar. Thank you, Arthi. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, sir, for the very uh, interesting and insightful talk. So uh, thank you for agreeing to be a part of BMSECON this year. And uh, thank you very much, sir. We thank you, Chairperson. Thank you for the invitation, too. Yeah. Thank you, Arun. Thank you. So we'll close the session for now. And uh, the oral presentations and YRS presentations will take place shortly. So we have given you links in the groups. Please follow the links and join the correct groups. So the presentations will end you from 2 p.m. onwards. Thank you. <laughs>